Welcome back to another episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bopst, and today's guest is Ben Ryan. Ben Ryan, PhD, is a postdoctoral scholar at Stanford University and a science communicator on social media. In his current research, Ben is exploring the neural basis of empathy and mechanisms by which empathetic behaviors can be advanced. In 2021, he received his PhD in neuroscience from SUNY Buffalo, earning the Dean's Award for Outstanding Dissertation Research. Ben's PhD thesis research focused on autism spectrum disorder and identified key systems in the brain that regulate social behavior. Ben also creates educational science videos for an audience of more than 850,000 followers on social media. In his videos, he summarizes recent research papers, teaches fundamental science principles, and debunks viral videos containing scientific misinformation. Ben has been recognized for his science communication with awards from Stanford University, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the Mind Science Foundation. So let's get this conversation going and welcome Ben Ryan to the Adversity Advantage podcast. Ben, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Doug. Looking forward to getting into this discussion. I'm excited to chat with you. And like I said before we recorded, I got to give thanks to Andrew Huberman who posted about you and anybody that Andrew you know, kind of recommends and encourages people to check out their content. It's definitely somebody that I always like to check out because I think Andrew is one of the, the smartest people that I've ever come across. So i got to give thanks to him. For sure. Yeah, he's incredible. He does an amazing job. So and thank him from me for sharing my content. Yeah. And so like him, you are also a, a neuroscientist at Stanford. You're also a researcher. And there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of content on neuroscience, on the brain, on things that are good for the brain, on things that are bad for the brain. And I know you you do you spend a lot of time researching, but also debunking, you know, stuff that isn't true regarding the brain. With everything that you've come across and, and what you know to be true from your research and everything, like what are like say three things that you know are good for our brain and three things that maybe are bad for our brain as far as things that we can actually control? All right. So it's nothing that you haven't heard before, but I mean, there's so much evidence on these three things, which is why you hear about them so much. And unfortunately, sorry, it's gonna it's not gonna be as entertaining, but my good things and my bad things are gonna be the same thing because they're just so like robust. So the first thing is for sure sleep, getting a quality night of sleep every night, settling into healthy sleeping habits is just so important for so many different things, for many different biological functions, um, many of which affect your mood and, and just, of course, your energy levels. So getting good sleep is like the number one thing. And on the other hand, a bad thing is getting poor sleep. So please, if you're a person who gets like, Anything under like seven hours of sleep, especially six hours of sleep. I know a few people who get like three to four hours of sleep and they say, oh, that's all I need. Just see what happens if you get six or seven, if you're coming up from three or four. I mean, personally, I always shoot for seven to nine. The last few nights I've been getting six and a half, seven, I haven't been feeling myself. Last night I got like eight and a half and I feel like I could do absolutely anything right now. So shout out to sleep. Second thing, for sure, exercise also. And, you know, funny thing, going back to Huberman, these are things that he talks about all the time, too. It's because us in the neuroscience field where there's so much good evidence for this, but exercise is incredible. It, it, it really does a lot for your brain. It does a lot for your mood. There's lots of evidence in animals that it can induce neurogenesis, which is the birth of new brain cells. It's just a phenomenal thing to do, not only for your brain health and your mood, but also for like learning capacity and things like that. It's just a, a great thing to do. And, and then on the opposite side, you know, being stagnant not getting up, sitting at your computer screen all day or on your laptop, you know, it's just try and get up and get a little exercise, move your body a little bit, going to be extremely important and, and going to make a big difference. Also, you know, again, if you, I, I always just encourage people to like try and do like a little bit more than you're doing. So if you're, if you're getting zero hours a day of exercise, you don't take a single step in a day, try and get just a little bit more, you know, walk a thousand steps. If you're walking 10,000 steps, maybe try going for a jog, you know, just elevating your current level of output may be able to make a really big difference in the way you feel. And then the third thing, and this really hits home for me as a, as a scientist who studies the neurobiology of, of social behavior, is to engage in frequent social interactions. Some people are really energized by social interactions, others are not, but we all sort of seem to have a kind of threshold of what amount of interaction sort of brings that level of, of comfort and satisfaction and happiness. For me, I'm a very extroverted person, so I need a lot of social interaction. And I find for sure that when I don't get in a lot of interaction, it really affects my mood. So just engaging in interactions, they don't have to be face-to-face -face necessarily. You know, I mean, I think 
hopping on a Zoom call or whatever, catching up with an old friend in a phone call, does a lot of the same stuff as what you might get from going to a major party with a lot of people and, and seeing you know, a lot of old friends. At least it hits on the same sort of circuitry, maybe not as robustly, but I recommend try to avoid isolation. And this especially applies for older populations. It's very common in the elderly to spend a lot of time alone and being isolated. So trying to get as much interaction as you can, you know, go, going to the grocery store and talking to the butcher or whatever, you know, whatever you got to do to get out there and get some interaction. I think it's, it's really important. I love how you, you just kept it simple with those three things and how they can either affect you positively or they can affect the brain negatively. And I, I want to go into specifically sleep because I think while I, I know that people know the importance of sleep, I think this is obviously something that we often overlook. So if you could maybe talk about what can actually happen to our brain, what can happen to our cognition when we don't get enough sleep over time, and then what are some signs that we're sleep deprived? Yeah, so sleep is not only important for regulating mood, but also, like you've said, for cognition. One of the main sort of deficits that comes along with sleep deprivation or insufficient sleep is a problem with something called working memory. So working memory is something you can think of as working with memory. So you're you're taking information that you've stored and you're kind of manipulating it and playing with it. And I came up with this very simple working memory task that I like to throw out there. And uh, it's by no means a scientifically validated measurement of how much sleep you're getting. But if you don't mind for the listeners, I'll just give this to people to think about for a second. So I'm going to name three food items. And I want you to list them in your head of what your favorites are. Okay. Corn on the cob, brownie, pizza. Pizza, corn on the cob, brownie. Really? A brownie is going to come in last for you. Oh man, that's, we, we might have to explore that a little, a little <laughs> bit further. <laughs> but no, I, okay. So that was, did you find that challenging at all? Well, I did because I was like, man, I, I got to remember these three things. That was the most challenging part about it. I mean, I don't have as much of a of a sweet tooth. I'm not a big chocolate guy, so maybe that's why brownie kind of came in in last. I was more like worried that I wasn't going to remember those three things, if I'm being honest. Yeah, exactly. So, and you did a fantastic job, of course. You know, you plucked them right out of your memory and reorganized them. But that's exactly what it is. It's like taking recent information. And working with it, and in this in this case, I've given you three things to remember. You have to structure them in your head, and you know you're manipulating them in your mind, and then you have to put them out again. So that's an example of kind of working memory test, something you might interact with on a daily basis. But uh, not getting enough sleep can impair that type of cognitive processing, and so you know you can imagine how on a daily basis you're in a conversation, someone says something, and you're like, wait, what the heck did they just say? I was going to say something, you know, I can't think of what I was going to say. So you know. It may seem like a simple thing, but also, of course, sleep can impair other more high-level, advanced cognitive processes. I mean, the more advanced a computational task is for your mind, the more challenging it's going to be for the brain. And so the, the less sleep you're getting, it's going to be even more difficult. Mm -hmm. So I guess some of the signs of you know being a little sleep-deprived are some of the things like you just said. You're having trouble remembering things. You're talking to somebody in conversation. They say something, and then you want to say something back, and you're like, wait a second, what did they just say, or what was I going to say, and you kind of forget. And like as you're saying that, I'm like, yeah, that's definitely happened to me <laughs> a lot, you know, when I haven't slept as much. I've heard or I, I read somewhere, and maybe you, this could, would be something that you could say is true or false, that like not getting enough sleep, because almost like you feel in a way like impaired by alcohol. Is there any truth to that? Like as in when you're sleep deprived, you feel similar to being like intoxicated? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm truly not sure. I mean, per anecdotally, I can say definitely, like a little bit, it, it definitely overlaps. I think another thing, though, with what people can look out for as a sign that they're tired or they're not getting enough sleep is a mood change. You know, I think the effects of sleep on mood are extremely powerful. There have been many, many studies that have shown that, you know, if, you, if you're not getting enough sleep, you're more predisposed to things like depression, anxiety. On my TikTok channel, oh, like a year ago, I actually put out a survey and asked people to, I gave them a bunch of random questions. A couple of the questions were, I kind of mixed them in so they wouldn't get the idea of what was happening. I asked them how much sleep they've been getting in the last two weeks and I asked them about their mood, like how happy and how like upset they felt. And I found like there was a, a significant correlation that the more sleep people got, the more positive their mood was and the, the less sleep they got, the more unhappy and depressed they were feeling. So, you know, just look out for a change in your mood. If you're not feeling the greatest, it's entirely possible that you're not getting enough sleep. And you might be going to bed 
at a reasonable hour and waking up at a reasonable hour and getting, you know, laying in bed for eight hours, but it could be something else. You could, it could be something affecting your sleep. It's not necessarily the amount of sleep or the duration that you're laying in bed. Your sleep quality could be poor for some unknown reason. There could be a noise in your room that's, you know, unpredictable. You're, you live by a street and there's a lot of honking or at night, in which case I might recommend a white noise generator. It could be the temperature of your room. It could be too hot. You know, all sorts of things could be affecting your sleep. You could have your dog in your bed that kicks you in the face like me every night. <laughs> There's a lot of things that can affect it. So take a really uh, careful look and a, and a deep, thorough lens when you're looking at your sleep and examining why it might not be the peak quality because it seriously makes a difference on your daily, the way you feel. So if somebody's listening to this and they're, they're relating to what you're saying, and they're like, oh my gosh, this is definitely me. My sleep's been off for months. It's been off for weeks. What are a few things that you think have a lot of data to back it up or that you've seen work with yourself that they could maybe try to implement to you know create this space to where they can improve their sleep quality? Yeah. I mean, so I have narcolepsy, a sleep disorder, and I am basically, I feel like terrible all the time if, if I don't get enough sleep, if I don't take really careful care of my sleep. And so what I do and what I find that works is consistency. So I go to bed and wake up at the same exact time rough, you know, give or take a half hour or so every night. I've been doing this for so long and I'm an early riser. So I go to bed around 10, 1030, maybe 1030 and wake up around 630. So I have a nice eight hour time that I always sleep. And this is great because it helps entrain your body into a, a physiological schedule where around the same time every night, your body's going to get tired, which is great because that one prevents you from laying in your bed for a while and you know struggling to fall asleep because when you're giving your body a 2 a.m. bedtime followed by a 10 p.m. bedtime and then you're switching it up all of the time, your body ha- can't really synchronize and start to produce natural chemicals and, and get into the natural process of progressing into sleep. So when you have that same time frame every night, it's easier for you to ease into that. That's an important thing. It also get, provides a more clear contrast for your body between wake and sleep. You know, it's middle of the night, your body knows, okay, this is when I'm usually sleepy. It's producing all those melatonin and things that'll make you tired. And then during the day, there's never any confusion about your body about, oh, is this a day where I'm going to be going to bed at four in the morning and I should be sleepy right now? You know, you're trying to get up early for work and you're having trouble. Maybe you should think about setting a, a pure time for your sleep. Other things, I mean, I mentioned a white noise thing. At one point, I actually did a a little literature review on this to see, does white noise make a difference? And if you have quiet sleeping conditions, white noise makes no difference. So it it will not improve the quality of your sleep or make it easier for you to fall asleep. At least the scientific studies show this. But if you do live in a place with unpredictable noise in the middle of the night, things that could wake you up like a dog barking or whatever, you live in a busy complex, things like that, then white noise could be good to, to drown out those sounds that might interrupt your rest. Also, I would not sleep with the TV on. I will admit, I did this for years. Um, When I was younger, I used to only be able to sleep with the TV on. Just not a good thing for your sleep. The noise is bad. The light is bad. Many opportunities to disrupt your sleep. I think getting into a consistent sleep schedule is so important, like you just said. I was actually having this conversation like this with one of my clients. And, you know, he's got a, he has a a job where he kind of works like odd hours a few days every few weeks. And you know, it kind of can mess his sleep schedule up. And I was just trying to encourage him like, listen, man, I think it would really benefit you to get into some consistent rhythm. So that way, when that time comes, you're not just thrown off then for the next few days, because, you know, you're doing something that's, that's kind of, you know, getting in the way of your, your normal sleep schedule. And I think the other thing that poor sleep, I would imagine can lead to is burnout where, you know, we're already in this world where it's like, we're chasing the next dollar. We're chasing more likes on social media. We're chasing more relationships, more and more and more. And then on top of that, we're just keeping ourselves just so busy all the time to keep up with that. And then we're not getting enough sleep. We're stressed out. Talk about if you could, because I know you've experienced this yourself, like the signs of feeling burned out, the impacts it can have on the brain. And then what are some things that somebody can do if they're feeling burned out to get them back to a place of stability? Yeah, totally. I mean, the burnout is real and it's um it can be really rough, you know. I I think a lot of us, at least I speak for myself when I say that I tend to take on too much and you know, I'm a very ambitious person. I'm always pushing myself and it's it just sort of sometimes feels like I hit a wall where my body and my brain just say, "Okay, this is too much." You know, like I can't go any further. And it's like my mind feels sharp enough, you know, I feel like I can go, I can keep going. But I hit like an actual like physical barrier where like there's just not enough of my physical body and strength to keep on going. And I think, you know, listen to your body, listen to your mind. 
In the situation I just described, I'm talking about a physical barrier, but you might also meet a psychological barrier where suddenly you have a loss of motivation to do the types of things that you normally like to do. You might just feel like you're struggling to pay attention to things. Any sort of cognitive wall or, or emotional change, listen to your mind, listen to your, your neurophysiology, your neurochemistry, because it's telling you, you know, it's time for a break. Especially with COVID, there was a lot of burnout and stuff. It was a tough time with, with the isolation, which I forgot to mention earlier, by the way, on the opposite side of the positive side of getting social interaction, isolation is extremely bad. It's just super bad for everyone uh, in the brain, especially, again, the elderly. So, you know, all this isolation can, can lead to burnout. It's just really important to have balance and to look for opportunities to uh, replenish your, your body through rest and your mind through whatever brings you gratification, you know, social interactions, exercise, all these things, you know, recharge you and recharge your physiology. And when it comes to, to treating burnout, I personally, and there's evidence for this too, str I strongly recommend mindfulness and like yoga, that type of stuff. It's kind of funny because it seems like in, in recent years, science has kind of begun to uptake a lot of these mindfulness and yoga type of practices and really demonstrate that there's a lot of efficacy there. Where in the past, you know, I'm not sure if, if things like yoga and science would have been very well enmeshed together. So, but, it, but certainly doing mindfulness meditations, breath work. Huberman actually mentioned Yoga Nidra on his podcast once and I gave it a try. That's amazing. 100% recommend that. I mean, you lay down and you just completely relax your body for as long as the exercise is and it is just such a recharge. So, you know, th these are short little intermediate. You're feeling stressed. You're feeling burnt out. Take an hour aside and go meditate, go for a walk, do something for yourself just to withdraw from all that that's draining you. Maybe at that moment, a social interaction isn't the best thing. Maybe an interaction is, you know, even more complex work for your brain because, heck, I mean, social interaction is a very dynamic process. There's a lot of, it's a workout for the brain. So maybe just relaxing into a meditation is a good idea, but also exercise. And recently I hit a, a serious wall with burnout and, uh, and I took a trip. I mean, not that I think escaping is the best <laughs> uh, coping mechanism, but for me, it, it was appropriate given that I, was, I had taken on too much. I was just really overwhelmed with, with all the work that I was doing. And so it felt like the right thing to just sort of pull myself away because I almost couldn't stop myself from continuing to work. It was like, I have so much to do. And even though I'm just so tired, I've hit that physical wall. I can't stop. And it was like, I need to make myself stop. I need to step away and go have a good time. So I met up with some buddies. We went to New Orleans. It was a great time. And I came back feeling very refreshed. Nothing had changed. That's why it's, <laughs> that's why it's not a good coping mechanism because I still had all that work to do. But don't neglect the signs to take care of your mental health when the time comes. Right. I think what's interesting about what you said is a lot of times when we're feeling so burned out and tired, we think what we need is some sort of stimulant, whether that be caffeine or some form of some form of excitement to kind of bring us up. But most of the suggestions that, that you laid out were all things that like were to calm you down and, and calm your nervous system a little bit. Maybe if you could explain the best of your ability, like from a neurological perspective, like in the brain, like what's going on when someone's burned out? Is certain parts shutting down? Is it, are there, is cortisol levels high? Like what's going on in the brain? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I have to admit, I don't actually know the answer. And I'm assuming probably there's some scientific evidence out there about the neurobiology of burnout. That's a heck of a question. And I promise you, I will look into it. And if I find answers, I will make a video on it. I mean, I, I would have to imagine that this just a sort of like a stress phenomenon, right? Like with repeated stress, the function of the brain declines, really, with chronic stress. Prefrontal cortex, a major part of the brain that's involved in higher level cognition and social cognition, things like that. Very important, very high level brain area. Its function declines with stress. And, you know, and again, this can lead to problems with working memory, things like that. So there might be actually a lot of overlap in the way the presentation is between sleep deficits and burnout. And certainly those two things together can be, can cause an exacerbation of either, right? So if you're more sleep deprived, you might become more burnt out. If you're more burnt out, the effects of sleep deprivation might become even more severe and, and really start to impair you. So again, you know, take it all into account, look at yourself and your lifestyle and try and be as healthy as you can because, and realize all the various factors that are playing on your daily performance. I know like one of the, the big pillars of your work is looking at the, the neuroscience of like social interactions and social connections and stuff like that. And I know that you've kind of mentioned that, you know, the, the way to 
optimize your brain health, the way to kind of get pull yourself out of burnout and to enhance your sleep, like all these things is by having healthy social interactions. Is is our ability to have healthy social interactions from based on what you know and research might say, is it based on like genetics? Is it based on our upbringing? Like what determines like how great we are socially? You mean like a personality, like how extroverted you are? Yeah. Cause I mean, there's, there's some people that like yourself that are extroverted and there's some people that, you know, are afraid to put themselves in new social settings. They're afraid to meet people. And I was just wondering where all that comes from. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's that actually, that question that right there is one of the main reasons that I went into neuroscience, because I would think it was the most interesting thing. You go to a party, you look around, there's a group of 10 people, they're all screaming, you know, everyone's trying to be the loudest voice. And then you have the people that are in the corner, you know, standing by the bar, maybe completely alone, not even interacting with anyone, just watching these people. And and maybe that's enough social interaction for them. But you know, there's this beautiful, in this case, kind of not beautiful, but to me, incredible spectrum of social performance, I suppose, you know, and the way everyone handles social interactions is different. And I've always wondered why, you know, that that unquestionably that reflects wide variety in brain function and brain chemistry and circuit function. And so I've always been interested in what brain circuits and what brain systems regulate social interaction and why do some people find reward in, in those loud kind of obnoxious interactions while others find those things extremely obnoxious and maybe uncomfortable. And so the question that you've asked is really kind of my research goal long term, but we don't actually have a, a true answer for that. Most of the evidence that we have, or the understanding we have about the neurobiology of social interaction comes from research on autism. So we understand to some level what neurobiological changes might lead to autism, but we're not necessarily sure if those same systems are just naturally fluctuating from person to person outside of the context of autism. What I like about you is that when you don't know something, you don't try to pretend like you do and just kind of create some like, you know, scientific answer that kind of becomes believable, be, you know, based on your background, you are like, you know, listen, like, I don't really don't know this. I don't know this yet. And I just think people are going to respect that about you. When it comes to maybe like changing your brain, though, in the sense where, you know, there's there's plenty of people, I think, that have gone from having a hard time socially to then becoming socially more skilled socially where they, they practice certain things or they, they put themselves out there more. Has there been any studies or any research done on like some protocols that, that can be done to help somebody become more skilled socially? Not that I know of. And I don't think I would assume not my suggestion, I suppose in the, in this context would just be exposure. I am of the belief that social interaction is trained. And I believe this happens at a very early age. I think that a lot of what we know, you know, the structural foundation of how we interact with people and what we understand about social interactions comes from a learned process that happens very early in life. Very, very early. You know, some of the first interactions, you say someone and someone makes a disgusted face and you're like, okay, I probably shouldn't talk about that in public then. These types of things, they're learned over time. So, I mean, you know, maybe it's possible. And I, and I think that actually that does shape the circuitry in the brain that then regulates social interaction thereafter. If someone doesn't find social interaction pleasant as an adult or isn't getting what they want out of it, it could be because of a genetic thing. Going back to your previous question about how the brain processes social information, it could be due to some sort of experience. You know, maybe in that early formative years, there was some experience that, you know, kind of made, made social interaction aversive or, or a combination of all those things. I mean, I just think like I said, social interaction is important, it's valuable, but it can also be used as sort of a tool for, you know, gaining satisfaction, relieving burnout, things like that. But if social interaction isn't comfortable, isn't pleasant, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that you that you have to train to become better at. But, you know, I do understand and empathize with that that feeling of, you know, wanting to get have more productive social interactions and I can tell you this right now there are no pharmacological treatments for the social symptoms of autism. And that is largely because the systems that regulate social interaction are very complex. There is evidence that thing, drugs like ecstasy, MDMA are pro-social. Not that I recommend taking ecstasy for social interactions, but you know, there are ways is what I'm getting at to enhance pro-social behaviors and to feel more connected with others. And that's actually part of what I'm studying in my research is how to enhance that sort of empathic connection. Let's dive into that because I think that is something that 
is extremely important for having healthy social interactions and interactions with with yourself is being able to become empathetic and and have empathy. And we live in this in the world right now where there's so much conflict amongst people and there's so much conflict inside ourselves where people are so hard on themselves. Based on your research and what you're learning now, what's the neuroscience of empathy and how can somebody begin to become more empathetic? Yeah, how people can become more empathetic, that is sort of the topic of my current research. And unfortunately, it's in the developmental process right now, so I can't talk too much about it. But I can say that that's a, an open question in neuroscience. But the neuroscience of empathy, I think, is one of the most fascinating topics. It's, there are some incredible studies, specifically in the context of pain. So if you're observing another person in pain, there's many studies showing that the same brain areas will activate as the person experiencing the pain itself. So, and it's thought that this is probably some sort of empathic process, right? And there's probably some evolutionary benefit too in activating the same brain areas. It's like, it's the same reason why if you watch someone or watch a car crash, it's hard to look away. You know, you're seeing someone get injured. It's hard to look away. It's because there's a ton of value in seeing what happens to someone else and how they're harmed because that can potentially protect you down the road. Um, it's like a biological thing. It's like our, our minds are like, let me get as much information as I can you know, from this person's unfortunate pain. And so viewing someone else's pain, the most advantageous situation is if your mind can sort of recapitulate that phenomenon and experience it yourself so that you can learn as much from it as possible. Also, just because humans are so social, and all animals are as well, or most animals are, feeling empathy, sort of allowing that experience of the other person to resonate with you by feeling the same, you know, experiencing the same brain activity. Um, it might be just sort of like a social phenomenon. And, and part of one of the reasons why humans are so socially driven is because our brains are just built this way that they, you know, we, we feel others pain. And so this whole, there's a, there's a ton of evidence on this, that these brain areas are activated or co-activated between a bystander and a person experiencing pain. But the thing that's really, really interesting is that if the pain, air quotes, pain that the bystander is experiencing through the brain activation is truly the same brain activation, then painkillers should relieve it. And indeed, there are studies that if you give a bystander something, acetaminophen, Tylenol, they will actually report someone else's pain as less severe and less uncomfortable to witness. So, and this, if you'd like, I can just continue building on this because there's just so much research. It's so, it's so crazy. So now there's also the topic of placebo painkillers. If you give someone a, a pill or a hand cream and you say, this is a analgesic medication, this is a painkiller, trust me, it works. We know it works, Okay. And then you like zap their hand or you like give them some sort of pain, they will report it as less painful, even though they've actually received a placebo, no real painkillers. But it actually, it does consistently, multiple studies show this, that they report feeling less pain. So the next question is, does a placebo painkiller also work for empathy for pain? So I said that Tylenol can block your empathy for someone else's pain in these studies. That's what they've shown. Does the same thing happen if you give them a fake painkiller? And once again, it does. So if you give someone a fake painkiller and you show them someone else in pain, they report it as less painful. And now the cherry on top of all this, the most interesting thing of all, is that in that same study, they gave them the fake painkiller and exposed them to someone else's pain. But then they gave them something called naltrexone, which is an opioid receptor blocker. And so opioids, you know, things like morphine, when you take these painkillers, they're, they're serious painkillers. They do an amazing job of pain relief and they act on these opioid receptors in the brain. So those opioid receptors exist in the brain because there's natural signaling in the brain that can induce pain relief in situations like stress or things like that. You know, you need to escape a predator and you need to turn off your pain. This type of stuff, it can happen naturally. So they gave these people the opioid receptor blocker and they found that it blocked the placebo empathy for someone else's pain. It blocked the placebo painkiller, which implies that when you give someone a fake painkiller, it actually activates natural, what we would call endogenous opioid signaling in the brain to cause a true painkilling response or that also reduces the level of empathy they feel for someone else's pain. So this whole collection of research is, I think, one of the most unbelievable things <laughs> in neuroscience. And so I'm really honored that I get to continue kind of studying the same topic in the research that I'm doing. But I will say the research that I'm doing is all in mice. And so I'm looking at like more of the biology, the, the circuitry, underlying these types of phenomenon.
Dude, that is so fascinating. That's crazy. As somebody, like I was an opiate addict, you know, and, and I haven't touched opiates and it'll be 14 years in October, but- Congratulations. Thank you. And I just remember, like, now Trexone wasn't, I mean, Suboxone was like the big thing when I, people took that blocked opiate receptors when I was doing my thing. And, you know, I, I used Oxycontin as a pain reliever for emotional and, and mental pain, not for physical pain. And I think- in my experience, a lot of people use addictive substances because they can't cope with stress. I know that there's been a lot of, of neuroscience out there that, that talks about how you can essentially, through neuroplasticity, like change your brain over time based on how you respond to stress. So maybe could you talk a bit about like what insights you would have on like how somebody can use like stress to their advantage and, and change their brain to have a healthier response to stress? Yeah, I mean, stress is just horrible for the brain. I mean, it's unavoidable, right? Like, I wouldn't worry about it, right? I, we all experience stress. I think the main thing, my personal perspective on this, is having the awareness and sort of introspective intelligence to recognize an opportunity to to take care of yourself in the situation. I think that is like the number one thing. And there's a lot of like neurofeedback types of stuff where if you can train physiological response that can be extremely powerful in the face of stress. So for example, there's like heart rate variability biofeedback where if you hook up a, a heart rate monitor and you can see your heart rate on a screen and you engage in a breathing exercise, that breathing exercise alone might be helpful, but being able to see your heart rate and watch your heart rate fluctuate with each breath and become completely empowered to regulate your own heart rate you're using that biofeedback of your heart rate to train a behavior that you can then pull out at any given time and being able to regulate your heart rate and calm yourself down when you're facing a stressful situation. I'll admit, I don't know if there's evidence showing this, but I would suspect, I would hypothesize that these types of like interventions in the middle of stress will at least reduce the impact of that on the brain. And so I think having the sort of emotional intelligence to recognize I'm stressed as heck right now, I'm not feeling good, whatever I'm working on, whatever's happening is super bad. Maybe you're in a situation where you can't excuse yourself. It's a social situation. Maybe being able to engage in some deep breathing exercises, or maybe if it's like a, a project you're working on, it's giving you stress, take a break, go for a jog, go for a walk, something like that, disengage, regulate your emotional response. Because I think if you can transition from a hyper aroused, super stressed state of being into a more like in control, cognitively on top of it, relaxed state, you're going to be mitigating a lot of the negative effects of the stress that it's having on you. So being able to take control, training on those types of things like heart rate variability, you know, biofeedback, those types of things, um, breathing mindfulness, again, can be really valuable, I would think, in the face of stress. That's what I would recommend. Absolutely. Because I think you have to create a, a new normal in a way. And I think a lot of times people just get caught up in these like habit loops and these patterns to where every time they're stressed, they might reach for a substance, they might lash out at somebody, and they might you know, sit on the couch for like, you know, a day or two or whatever. And that becomes a pattern that they end up doing every time they're stressed. And I think if they can just try some of these things that you said of when they're in a stressful moment, like having the emotional awareness to say, okay, like, I'm just going to try this. And then I'm going to keep trying this. I'm going to keep trying this, that at least gives you a good shot at creating some new neural pathways to change the way you respond to stress over time. And that kind of leads me into the next thing I want to talk to you about, which is epigenetics. When I grew up, like I thought that most of what happens to us, whether that was the way I was built physically or my brain and everything was was mostly genetics. But now I think there's a big message out there that genetics don't have nearly as much to do with it as people think. What is your insight or what is your stance when it comes to genetics and, and how important are our genes as far as how we live on a day-to-day -day basis and do we have the ability to actually change our genetics for the future? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely both. You know, there's this nature versus nurture debate that has, you know, existed since the beginning of man, it seems. The way I look at it is your genetics, your, your genome is your blueprint, right? And so imagine that your body is a home, a building. It doesn't have to be a house. It could be a building. And the structure of that building and the code or the blueprint for everything inside of it, anything that can go inside of it, is all right there in that blueprint. And so you can't really change that. 
you know, you, you, let's say your blueprint is a warehouse and you want to make it into a school, that might be a challenge, you know. So you're kind of stuck in that. It's sort of rigid. Uh, it is rigid. Your genes can't change once you're born with them. But your epigenetics is how the, the usage of your genes changes with experience. And so this is where this dynamic of nature versus nurture. Nature is your genes that you're born with. Nurture is how your experiences shape the function of those genes. And so, I mean, literally what happens is you have DNA that's in the nucleus, stable as ever, the holy molecule. It's, you know, every cell needs it. And then you have RNA, which is whenever your genes, an individual gene might need to be used for something, it's transcribed into RNA. Sorry, I'm mixing up translation and transcription. It's transcribed into RNA. And then from RNA, it's translated into protein. And so every gene, it has some function in the cell. So just like you have this home, you can think of every gene like a table, a desk, a TV, a chair. It's some component, a wall, a picture on the wall. It's some component. They all have a function. And so let's say, you know, in this analogy, your cell is getting ready you're getting ready for dinner and you realize that you don't have enough forks. Okay, now you need to tr take that DNA from the nucleus, that blueprint for the fork, and transcribe it into the RNA and then translate it into a physical protein, the physical fork that you're going to use for dinner. And then when you're done, you throw it away. That's how the cell works. So the cell is going through some process. It needs a molecule. It will use the DNA that it needs to get that process done. And then afterwards, that, pr that protein is discarded and you know to make space for new proteins. The RNA is discarded, which is the intermediate molecule. So epigenetics is really what's regulating like the usage of your blueprint based on what you need. And so stress, all sorts of things can dysregulate, like poor sleep can dysregulate your usage of your genes. So it's definitely both. And I guess when asking the question of like, what's the role of each epigenetic dysregulation can lead to like short term or long term changes, I suppose, in like your mood or things like that, where genetic, like a genetic mutation, it will be something different about the way that in neuroscience, the way your brain functions, which could lead to some sort of, you know, condition that can affect literally like anything. It, it could be a condition with like, it could be a neurodegenerative condition. It could be a developmental condition, something with sleep, something with mood, all sorts of stuff. So they, they really work together. Got it. That makes sense. And that helped clarify some things that I was curious about when it comes to these two things. Cause like I said, for the longest time, I thought that my genes actually determined everything. And then I learned over time, like, wow, like I actually can change my body. I can change the way I respond to stress. I can change my habits just through, you know, consistency and daily practices over time that added up to some bigger wins for me overall as a human being. I will warn there are, they, I have seen a lot of like sort of advertisement for things like kind of what you're describing that like really in that same spirit of you can change your genes, you can change who you are, it's not set in stone. And I don't think that message is always really used harmlessly. I think that a lot of times those claims are made without you know, valid basis for it. I want to clarify, I'll give an example. So let's say you're born with a mutation in a gene, and this gene does some process in the cell that is important for your mood. So let's say you're born with this gene mutation that no matter what you do, you're going to be in a bad mood because, you know, and, and maybe this presents as depression. Okay. And so you're born with this. It's very hard to address epigenetics. All that, all that changing your genetic expression can do is change how much of that protein is expressed. But if there's a mutation in the protein, it's not working properly. It doesn't matter how much of it you have or how little of it you have. It's still going to be functioning improperly. And so epigenetics only helps in the case of like, the overall landscape of your genes, like if you expose yourself to positive experiences and, you know, you're getting, getting good sleep, you're getting good social interactions, you're exercising, that sort of stuff, but it can't compensate for any natural biological change in your genetics that you have that might be leading to some condition. All right. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thanks for pointing that out too. I think I saw somewhere in your content that that is a big thing for people to pay attention to, that it's one thing to kind of change your genes with the genetic mutations, like kind of are the things that control the genes. So it's, you can't change that part of the equation. Right. Yeah. It's set in stone. I mean, if you're born with the gene mutation, most likely it's in all of your cells. And so it's there. But the good thing about that too, is that if you're not born with the gene mutation, there's no way for all of your cells to suddenly undergo a gene mutation. You know, you might have UV exposure on your arm and you get sunburned and the 
a gene, some DNA mutates on those skin cells, but it's not going to affect your brain or anything like that. So if you're born healthy genetically, then that will not change over time in terms of mutations, at least. Got it. I want to get into something else that's often talked about as far as the brain, and that is sugar. And I I saw you kind of debunk somebody online about this. And without getting, without calling anybody out specifically, I know this is like a big topic now is that there's a lot of people that are saying that like sugar destroys people's lives. There's been people that have like compared sugar to other harmful addictive substances. And while I'm I'm not saying that eating a bunch of sugar is like the best thing for your body, I just know it's, I don't think it's as bad as sometimes it's made out to be. So talk a bit about like the video that you made as far as like what was some of the information that was being pushed out because I think that information is kind of common now. What was true, if anything, and what's the real truth about how sugar impacts our brains? Yeah, so the video was this guy saying that sugar is more addictive than cocaine, which was a very bold claim. And the answer, whether or not that's true, it is false. Sugar is not more addictive than cocaine. Cocaine is an extremely addictive substance. But there is a little bit of reality to this idea of uh, sugar addiction. So sugar addiction does exist. Sugar is extremely rewarding. It activates reward centers in the brain. And so like anything that activates reward centers in the brain, it has sort of an addictive liability. But what I say in this video is that, you know, like anything can technically fall into this category, anything that's rewarding. So like if you're really loving this podcast right now and it's activating your reward centers, theoretically, podcast listening could be addictive. But I don't want to make too light of it, though, because, I mean, there is evidence that, you know, like mice will lever press, but they will press a lever for sugar administration but absolutely not anywhere near the level that they will for cocaine. And, you know, in, in these studies, they're also, there's things like they're, they're water deprived, so they're thirsty and they get sugar water and so they press it. There's a big difference between craving something and wanting it, you know, because sugar tastes good and you're thinking, yeah, you know, that chocolate bar sounds pretty good right now versus a true neurobiological change underlying addiction where it becomes an uncontrollable impulse. So, you know, I think sugar gets demonized and a lot of the time on social media, you see people making strong, bold claims that seem remarkable. And then you find that at the end of the video, there is a miraculous solution that they're offering you. Like I saw another one recently where a guy was talking about the pH of soda and, and then, you know, turns out he poured some a pH meter into the soda and it was really acidic and whatever. And then it turns out that he's selling some kit to make your water more basic, you know, turn it alkaline. And it's, uh, you know, there's just a lot of content on the internet that it doesn't always align with the evidence. And sometimes it turns out that those people are selling something. But anyways, back to sugar, there is some sort of addictive potential for sugar, but it's pretty uncommon. And you know, I think if you're eating way too much sugar, you'll probably know it, you know, I, I do encourage to sort of cut back your sugar as much as you can. You know, I, I don't really drink soda, things like that. You know, once in a while, I'll go wild on a dessert. But, you know, I think if you're eating too much sugar, you probably know you're having a regular sh a lot of sugar, you know, candy, candy bars, things like that. Yeah. You brought up a really good point because I think like the dose, I think, can make the poison. And also that, that like it's just some things that are online and that are you know, in a way, videos are created to drive attention and grab views, not necessarily to have your best interest at heart, right? And that sugar, yes, can be bad, but it's not nearly as bad as cocaine. Like, there's, it's a very, that comparison, it's like comparing apples to like watermelons, you know what I mean? There's such, such a big difference in the addictiveness in each one of those that, you know, creating, I think creating videos like that can be harmful because when people say that, it continues to drive this narrative that you should be afraid of certain foods. And, you know, I think certain things obviously can be unhealthy and certain things can be healthier than others, but it doesn't mean that you can never have them. It doesn't mean that if you eat like a piece of chocolate that all of a sudden, like your, your life's going to be over. Right, exactly. And, you know, you can overdose on water. You can drink so much water that you get sick. I mean, sugar, glucose is what one of the main things that powers the brain. And so it's not like, you know, if you have too much, yes, it can be bad. If you have too little, it can also be bad because this is why we have blood sugar monitors and things like this because sugar is an important part of human physiology. Cocaine, on the other hand, is certainly not. You can live your entire life without having cocaine and, and never get sick about it. Absolutely. And kind of speaking on the addiction side of things, I know that one of the things that goes 
hand in hand a lot of times with addiction is other mental health struggles. And I saw that you had a conversation, I think it was somebody from Johnson and Johnson who was like maybe their head of neuroscience and he talked about potentially like how we can maybe start to discover symptoms of certain mental health issues with people before they're actually like there. Talk a bit about like what you've learned about that and, and maybe throughout that process, if there's any signs that somebody can be aware of to maybe pay attention to that if they're on the verge of becoming, you know, depressed or or anxious and that sort of thing. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Unfortunately, that discussion that you're talking about doesn't really lend itself well to like self-awareness because there are tools that are being developed that can sort of are, are a sub-threshold detection. So they look for things like changes in your voice tone or changes in the way you've been using your phone. So these are technologies that can be built right into your iPhone to detect common changes in behavior that are predictive of things like depressive episodes or, or suicidality. And so, I mean, you know, there's a whole big discussion here of privacy, right? And like, it's kind of an ethical discussion of, should I grant any company or entity access to my data in a way that could be used to help me? Personally, it's something that I would be comfortable with. But it's so interesting that, you know, there is evidence that something like the, a change in the tone of your voice or the cadence of your language, the way you're speaking, can be a high-powered predictor that you're about to fall into a depressive episode. And so in that type of situation, you could be alerted by your phone or you know, encouraged to reach out to a counselor or psychiatrist, therapist, whatever, to potentially protect you from a situation that could turn really bad. I think it's extremely interesting and it falls right in line with what we're kind of experiencing right now in all aspects of medicine and, and technology is that there are a lot of findings developing in science and a lot of technological advancement happening in like the tech space. And there's a lot of entrepreneurial opportunity at the intersection of both. And so we're seeing things like at home blood sugar monitors or genetic testing to look for predispositions to certain conditions or things that, you know, certain medications that might be beneficial for you. We're getting into the, the time of personalized medicine. And part of it excites me, part of it scares the shit out of me, part of my language. But I'm just really curious to see where this goes. And I, and I certainly hope that when the time comes that policymakers are uh, well informed about the use of these types of things to both their, the benefits and the disadvantages of all of them. Right. Because yeah, there's obviously there's, there's, there's advantages and there's disadvantages. I mean, I can definitely like see why some obviously people would struggle with the, with the privacy thing. I think that's just something that, you know, you have to be comfortable with. And I can obviously see both sides of that. On the other hand, my own experience and, and talking to some other people, like when you get down like, into a depressive episode or you're in one of these anxiety loops where you're just caught in the thick of anxiety, as much as you know, there's there's tools and there's a lot of ways people can get out, it's very challenging like to get out once you're in that point. And a lot of people just have a hard time getting out and they end up staying in that same place, they end up turning to other substances and things to to manage that that time in their life. So I think it would be really cool to be able to alert people to know, like, hey, like, listen, there might be a sign. This might be a sign that you might have to reach out, ask for help, and potentially talk to somebody. Dude, this has been awesome. I could spend like days talking to you because this like I love chatting science neuroscience i love talking about the brain mental health like all the stuff we've been discussing today but definitely want to be respectful of your time i know you're a busy guy and i think that people they're going to want to follow you on tiktok they're going to want to you know read more about your work they're going to want to check in with you on instagram like where's the best place for people to find out more about your work your research and your content online of course. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. I have definitely enjoyed this conversation a whole lot. Easiest place to connect with me on all fronts would be my website. It's my name, Ben Ryan, B-E-N-R-E-I-N.com. But there's also a button. You can email me. You can check out my social media. You can download all my research papers if you're at all interested in that. Uh, you know, paywalls are a problem. So they're all there for free. You can read about my research, all sorts of stuff. So please do. And uh, thanks for your interest. Of course, man. This is awesome. And I will make sure to plug all that stuff in the show notes. And for those listening, what I invite you to do is to, to share a takeaway. And maybe it was something that Ben said as far as things that can have positive effects on your brain, things that can have negative effects on your brain. Maybe it was something that we talked about with regards to sleep, burnout, social interaction. Maybe it was something that we just talked about with regards to sugar. Whatever it was, whatever your takeaway was, tag Ben 
tag myself because we'd love to hear your feedback. And we once again, thank you for listening to this episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst. We'll see you next time.